This is Don Larson again. We're are ready to get started. We've got a nice group gathered here. So uh, just the um, uh, the uh, uh, housekeeping rules again for everybody that will be following for this uh, webinar presentation. All attendees will be muted during the webinar. Uh, until the end when we go to a Q&A. If you experience any technical issues during the webinar, use the little chat window to communicate with us. The computer audio is the recommended, but you can also uh, telephone in as you've already learned. Uh, we have some handouts I wanna call your attention to over in the handout section. Some little handouts where you can drag and drop, little PDFs you can drag and drop to your desktop. And so we welcome you to invite you to to have a look at those. And then uh, uh, post any questions that you have during the webinar. Uh, you can wait to the end and during the Q&A, but, um, but feel free to post them, it's good, and then we can, so we can be reviewing them as we, and thinking about them as we go. And then we'll, at the end of the webinar, we'll, we'll answer all the questions, and if we do run out of time, we'll make sure that we email you. So for those of you who are not familiar with Larson Software, we're based in Houston, Texas. We were founded in 1984 by a group of technology, graphics technology experts, and we've been doing that for over 30 years. We develop powerful, innovative graphics software and toolkits based on open uh, graphics standards. We've promoted CGM since its beginning by providing a free CGM viewer. Uh, we recently uh, replace that with a subscription version, which you can now buy a copy of online on our store with that URL shown there. We're also the developer of the first HTML5 CGM viewer that eliminated the names for plugins. We're also a member of the CGM Open Foundation, and our products are known to simplify the graphics workflow for technical publication professionals. And so there's our website URLs for those of you who would like to learn more about Larson Software. So with that said, I'm uh, now going to turn it over to David for the main part of our presentation. Uh, thank you, Don, and uh, welcome everybody to today's uh, webinar. Uh, it's good of you to join us. Um, so today's topic is interactive illustrations. Um, what I want to try and do is just uh, talk about a bit like the history of the uh, of interactivity and illustrations, and then really focus down on how we would create interactivity in both 2D and 3D uh, file formats. And I think the key is here, like file formats, you really need to choose the correct one for your particular scenario how are you going to distribute the information in what kind of about a web or whatever you choose then we'll do a brief summary and as don mentioned a q a at the end so as don uh, advise if you want to post your questions as we go along as they come to mind that'd be good and then we can at least review them before we get to that particular point in the presentation so again thanks for joining us today um, quite a lot to go through and quite a few demos. Uh, probably one of the most complex ones uh, we've done uh, in, resp in res uh, respect to demos, the lots of different pieces of software and the web and so forth. So hopefully everything goes smoothly. It is live, not recording. So please bear with us. So as a introduction, um, certainly interactive illustrations have, have been out there for some time and, and, and and generally accepted as a way of delivering information. It's still probably not the most common way because there's a lot of legacy information out there in the technical publications, but um, certainly as far as kind of illustrated parts data, that's been uh, uh, interactive for some time, uh, going back many years. And we'll, uh, we'll discuss that in a bit more detail. Uh, we see some very specific file formats that are required probably more today for embedding interactivity. 
Uh, and they, those really are CGM and SVG, which you, have been the most prominent ones, which you've probably all heard of. Um, we'll also discuss 3D formats today and how they support metadata and perhaps how you could use those in your publications as well. Uh, certainly metadata, which really is the information that's non-graphical, is the key really to interactivity. So things like hotspots and hyperlinks that wouldn't normally be in a graphics file. And so the key is how do we author that information in and deliver those interactive illustrations? And what are the benefits really for doing that as well? So historically, um, certainly been around for some time and probably some of you, the audience might remember that we had interactivity way back really with, uh, again, specifically more with illustrated parts data. And what we'd usually have is like a raster image file, uh, usually a TIFF. Uh, and that TIFF file, although not capable of supporting metadata, could be combi combined with an overlay file, which did create that, inf uh, contain that information. So then we'd have to layer over that um, file over the TIFF, and then hopefully in those two in conjunction with a suitable viewer, you'd provide the interactivity. Uh, the downside really to that is we've got two separate files, not um, which you then have to edit independently of each other, but also the, uh, the solution usually turned out to be proprietary. So um, that system had to be maintained and so forth by the usually a solutions provider. And it wasn't that easy to distribute because you'd have to be based on a solution provided by the same vendor. So it wouldn't, it wouldn't be like a web environment. Um, usually it would be something proprietary. But today we have uh, open formats like CGM and, and SVG. And the CGM version 4 really was a game changer and it, could, it supported metadata. So the CGM versions before that, if you weren't aware, even up to version 3, did not support metadata, which means we, we couldn't have hotspots and hyperlinks and so forth within the file. But with, it, with CGM 4, that really changed. The other format that now is being used widely uh, mainly because it's support in a web environment is SVG, and that can also contain hotspots. Um, and we'll talk about that in more detail as we go along. Another thing we're going to discuss today is um, 3D data. Um, again, we can have interactivity there between the, say, text and also the 3D information. But um, I think with 3D, it's a bit, the interactivity is a bit more pervasive because you can actually interact with the model itself. In other words, you could reorientate it, look at it from a different angle. So I'd also describe that as interactive as well, not only linking, but also just the fact that you can interact with the model. But I think there's a lot of questions you have to answer before you publish that 3D information. You know, what are the benefits to the end user of doing that? You know, they're going to gain something from it. Uh, how do we create that information uh, in cost effectively? Obviously, there's a lot of CAD systems out there, but perhaps not all of them are designed to specifically create uh, information for an end user. And how do we publish that? Is it going to be a web browser or a very specific viewer, 3D viewer, which there are, are lots of them on the market? But primarily, I think we would, in technical publi publications, want to deliver within a web environment. Uh, so I think for the end user, interactivity is a really nice thing to have because it means they can hopefully navigate the data a lot more easy than it would be if it's just static. But there's a lot of, um, to actually implement that, there's a lot of dependency on the file format that you choose. Uh, and also there's going to be an overhead to actually author that information. So things like hotspots, you need to add those efficiently. Uh, the most common interactivity is usually found in illustrated parts diagrams, so you needed a, a way of linking those together. Um, but also, we I think the other thing we've found is that there's a big interest in interactivity in wiring diagrams, like for wire tracing. It's not something we'll cover today, but it is another interesting area for interactive illustrations found in technical documentation.
So I, I think there's really, as I mentioned earlier, a big kind of reliance on file formats here. And that's why I'm going to kind of focus on that in today's presentation. Um, in a 2D world, I think we have CGM and SVG. And I say possibly PDF uh, because although it can contain hyperlinks and so forth, it's not as easy to deliver in a web environment. So, uh, but I believe CGM and SVG are. So all those formats contain that interactive areas which allow us to um, interact with the file and it's embedded into the file as well. So we, in theory, we wouldn't need a second file to have that interactivity. I think with 3D, um, there's really multiple formats you could choose. Um, and what we've tried to do is over the last kind of year or so is, is narrow down uh, a choice for ourselves to focus on and hopefully help our customers, guide our customers in that direction as well. So we've, we've really uh, come down to GLTF and GLB, which are essentially the same uh, formats, uh, but just encoded in a different way. Uh, X3D and VRML. So today we're going to focus down on GLTF and X3D. But those are the three. If you're aware of 3D, you'll know that there's a whole plethora of the formats. So difficult for us to advise and, and support all of those and have information on all of those. So with hotspots, you know, the major consideration is how do you add them? You're going to really need some software capable of doing that. Uh, in the CGM arena, uh, as you probably found, if, you, if you're working in that aerospace, defense, automotive, it's usually um, a niche piece of software like our VizX edit. Um, but with SVG, the, the choice is definitely wider, but not necessarily better. Um, we've found um, SVG, the support of exporting SVG from different pieces of software can be very poor, a bit kind of not reliable, and certainly not interoperable. In other words, if you export it out, importing it and get back in is not great. So some very inconsistent results, uh, especially when describing hotspots. And we'll discuss how we've tried to uh, standardize on that in our own software. So first one is CGM. I think probably the audience here is, is very aware of the CGM format. It's been around for, for many years. Um, and it really can contain hotspots in, um, or interactivity, potential for interactivity in four different file formats. Um, so this might seem confusing, but um, with, il with the illustration with a CGM, you can actually add the hotspots very easily but then they don't really mean anything until you uh, link them to something else. So in this case here, I've got a, a data module, but also HTML. Those are the, you know, the couple of options where you can link the illustration, the CGM, to um, the textual data, say for an illustrated parts diagram or maintenance manual. So you can link between the two and uh, actually get some value. The other two uh, files that you could use but are optional uh, companion files. Um, in, in the S1000D arena, they have the X, XCF, XML companion file, and also the IMF, which is another XML fi encoded file. Um, they're usually only required for certain probably customers who have decided to hold the interactive information outside of the, the CGM file. So we'll look at those briefly today, but I, I think those are not widely used, but certainly options if you need to. So in a bit more detail, um, the, the CGM file itself uh, would usually be inserted into the XML data, and then you'd have to link the two together. So the hotspot information in the CGM would need to be linked to the data module, the XML file, and the same would apply to the HTML. And then the XCF and the IMF can contain that same information externally. So that can be a benefit if you need to edit those separately to the illustration, perhaps. So 
So in this uh, figure here, we'll, we'll also look at this in, a, in more demo, demo scenario. But I wanted to show the, the in the bottom right, we have the illustration with the hotspot properties and the ID, which is really the, the thing that will help us link between the two. So here we see the uh, hotspot properties within the CGM file. And here we have the, the ID within the, um, within the XML. So that is really the key to making the link happen. So the XML is here and obviously the CGM is here and then that common ID really will link the two together. And in HTML, similar but different in respect here we're using JavaScript and here we have the, uh, again, the ID, the hotspot ID and again, repeated down here and then we can forge that link between the two, between the illustration and the text. Um, we mentioned the XCF, uh, this is the companion file and you can see again within the companion file, this is a common thread, here's the ID again and then the IMF, which is the other type of companion file, we also see the ID. So you get the idea that to, to perform linking between text and graphics, you're going to need a, a common kind of thread that links the two, the data together. So this is our first demo. Um, what I've got here is uh, an illustration, uh, obviously created already, but I want to add some hotspot information to it. So I'm in our VizX edit software. So what I'm going to do is add a call out to this. So our call out tool will automatically uh, number this, but what it will also do is it will add a hotspot at the same time. So I don't need, you might not notice, but as I drag and drop the uh, call out, it's adding the hotspot information over here. So if I click on this and um, uh, modify, you'll see that I can add screen tips in or URLs into this. So now I've created an illustration, a CGM illustration with the hotspot information that, that's needed. Uh, I can just highlight to see the hotspots here that I've created. Uh, well, I should be able to view them. Anyway, so just escape from this. Okay, so now I've got my illustration with hotspots. I now need to view this alongside my other data uh, in, say, in a web environment. So let's just uh, go to, in this case, this is Chrome. So here's the illustration. I created this illustration and, and finished it off with the uh, annotations. And what we've done here is we've linked the, uh, the hotspot to the parts list. So this is all HTML, is the code I showed you earlier. And as we move around, you can see that as I move over the hotspot, it highlights the, uh, the parts list which obviously gives us a, a lot of value. The CGM, this is a CGM and um, there's no plugin here. This is just using our VizX View HTML5 technology. So the linking should also work in the opposite direction as well. So if I click on washer, you'll see that it links this way. So it's like bi-directional. So this for the user will be really useful to identify the part either by the illustration or by the parts list. So we begin to see the benefit to the end user of interactivity. Okay, so let's go back to our slides. So I did mention uh, SVG or scalable vector graphic. Just to quickly uh, give you an overview of that if you're not aware. Um, SVG, again, it's been around probably more years than you think. Um, it's really a big specification. Uh, when we first kind of started looking at it, we were surprised of how much is in there and how little we need from a technical illustration point of view. So um, there's two actually uh, profiles for SVG. There's the full and the tiny. The tiny is, was more designed so SVG could go on phones and tablets. And that's probably closer to what we needed from a technical illustration publications point of view. So we, did, we didn't really need all the attributes that are in there. 
So some of the benefits for SVG is that it's XML encoded. So certainly within like aerospace, defense, and so forth, XML is, is obviously widely used. It's an open format. So that is a, a good thing as far as SG, SVG is concerned. Um, the downside is, is that it's a big spec with no particular schema aimed at that industry. So um, to actually get the real benefit from it, we see that you need a profile for it and um, try to limit the, the number of attributes that are in there so we can in, make the file more interoperable. So we found that it's not really a good format for interoperability as it as a plain kind of SVG file. Uh, the file size can also balloon around that as well so that you can get finish up with a really large file. Um, and the off-the-shelf off schema covers the whole spec so that there's no way of validating against anything that's a smaller thing. So we came up with a, an idea of creating our own profile. We call that Tech SVG. So it's like a combination of full and the tiny specs. And it really gave us a way of standardizing how we write a file and primarily how we write hotspot information. So that means that it's we get a consistent way of actually producing SVGs with interactive information like hotspots. So that's one of the real reasons we did it um, is to really help our customers uh, really export and use SVG in a web environment. So one of the major benefits of SVG is it's native to HTML5. So it's native to the web, which is obviously a, a good thing. Um, so it's really straightforward to actually display an SVG inside, say, Chrome or uh, Firefox, whatever web browser you have. The only downside is there is no real viewing environment. You'd have to kind of create that yourselves. And so if you wanted a toolbar with uh, with a magnifying glass and so forth, or any other functionality you require, you'd have to kind of build that yourselves. We've kind of come to a halfway house with that where we actually introduced it into our ActiveX uh, technology. Um, so we now support that in there. So you, you could have a toolbox using that particular technology. So with SVG, I've got a few uh, demos just lined up to give you some ideas of, of what can be done. Some of them I've actually shown before. Let's just go back to the uh, to the web. So this is an SVG, um, so which is really linked to some data, which I think is really nice. So it feeds back data as you drag over it. Just in this case, it's just an Excel spreadsheet. So you have a vector graphic, which is then displaying data from the day, uh, Excel spreadsheet. So this is where SVG, SVG for me is primarily using kind of dashboards where they want to feed back information about a particular metric or uh, key key uh, environment. So yeah, it's it's got some really good features in there, not ones that we might use in the illustration world. But one definitely we we we're interested in is animation. So. If you've got a, if you want to animate, then SVG is a really good format for that two D animation. That is, so we we can do a lot with it from an animation point of view. It's good quality, and obviously it's native to the web. So here we we see some interactivity. This could have been triggered by a a, a start button or whatever. So good good way of in, uh, actually distributing interactive information. Okay, so how do we create um, how do you create an SVG file? So if I just go back to uh, Visex Edit, it's really straightforward. So perhaps number one here, um, I want to uh, modify this, and I just want to add a, a screen tip. So let's just say uh, we'll call this that bush. Oh, sorry. Okay, I'll just say okay to that. That adds us to here. And then I want to save this as a, an SVG file. Let's just put this on the uh, desktop. 
So I'm just going to take off that bit there because it's now annotated. Uh, so you can see it's SGG, desktop and save. And now if I quickly go to my desktop, here's the file, double click, and it should open it into, in this case, it's gone into um, Edge, Microsoft Edge. And as I move over the file, you should see that we have the hotspot, so the interactivity, and then the name, the tooltip we gave it. So very easy to actually put into a web environment. What you don't see here is what I mentioned earlier, is you don't see a toolbox to zoom in and out and so forth. And uh, this doesn't actually link to anything. I could have actually created a link that would take us somewhere. In this case, I didn't create a link, but this could link us to something else. It could be another illustration or the text itself, as we did in the HTML uh, with the CGM file. Okay. So SVG, very, uh, very easy to uh, put into a web environment and have interactivity. So let's move on to 3D. Um, we said at the beginning that I would kind of focus on specific formats. And um, in this case, we're gonna focus on uh, GLTF, GLB. Um, this is PowerPoint. Obviously, I'm using it for the slides today. But interestingly, uh, Microsoft have actually uh, are using GLB within their Office products. So you can actually insert a GLB or a GL, what's well, a GLB file inside this PowerPoint. So you could see that I could interact interact with it here by clicking on it. I have um, interactivity with it. So uh, if you want more information on GLTF, uh, just visit this website. Kronos is the, is the organization that actually looks after the format, along with a lot of others as well. Um, and it's primarily used for publishing data in, in, a, in a web environment. Uh, and one of the reasons for that is that it, it's a really uh, efficient file size uh, and easy to put into web environment and, and show scenes as I just did before then. And, in the PowerPoint, and it really minimizes the file size. They they kind of call it the GL, GLTF is the JPEG of, of 3D. So there are, I think there's very, several benefits for GLTF and technical publications. As I mentioned, it's easy to publish in a web browser. The file sizes are really optimized, so it's quicker to load and to, than to store the data. It supports the addition of metadata like hotspots. Uh, the text annotations can be added easily. And they're also uh, what are called placarded. That means that they don't spin with a model, they'll stay flat, which I can show you an example of. And it has the ability to display animation as well. So a lot of the things, a lot of ticks, all the boxes, I think. And plus it has really good in, easy integration with Microsoft Office products as well which I think is a big plus. So you can see I've put some of the links to some of the demos. So when you get the slide pack, I'll, I'll make that available on, our, on LinkedIn. You should be able to go to these links. So you don't worry about trying to make a note of them here as we go along. Okay, so let's look at uh, GLB. I'm gonna go back to uh, I'm going to go back to VizX Edit. This is VizX Edit 3D. Uh, and what I want to do is show you like a process of perhaps creating a, uh, a GLB file. So I've got here the, the turbo on this particular engine, and I'm just going to isolate that. And I just want to, um, so I'm not going to give you a full demo of this software. I just want to quickly get to a point where I can export it. So I just want to um, explode this out. So let's just take a few parts and we'll explode them. So as I said, this is live, so hopefully everything goes well. Okay, so what I want to do now is um, export this. And I'm going to choose uh, GLB. And 
we'll put this on we'll call this turbo and we'll put this on our desktop so I can easily find it and we'll save that so in this case I want to uh, export the visible only with the height so I don't want to export the whole model just what's visible and when it's completed it will uh, uh, open in the file but I don't want to do that I just want to go onto the desktop so let's say okay so I think it's done it doesn't take long okay so the, here's the turbo GLT so I'm going to go now to um, back to Chrome and have this uh, again this is the model editor which it, there was a link to so you'll be able to find this so this is a Chrome technology and I can just drag the GLB to here and then we have our model that we just uh, created in uh, physx 3d okay so I can spin it around and so forth just takes a few seconds just to load sometimes okay so on the on the right hand side I have some really straightforward tools now in one of them you should see the uh, ability to add, add a uh, hotspot so let's just go to here hotspots and add hotspot and then I can say I want to click on here I give it a label I know this is the uh, let's say the exhaust puts it onto here and when I click on it you can see that it's it's interactive and when I spin the model you can see the uh, the exhaust here in this case stays flat the text so that's why I described this placard in when you go behind the model it does disappear but while it's visible it stays flat so you can see the the speed that I've taken the the GLB I exploded it I've saved it and now I'm in a web environment and I've added value to it so what happens here this creates what we call a snippet of, of HTML which then you could copy and paste into a, a web page for instance we're still working on some more demos around this um, but I think that gives you an idea of the speed that you could do that particular thing so now I'm just going to bring up um, hopefully bring up word I thought, I thought I had word here somewhere okay so I've already put that first file that I was using as a demo into the word document so you can see that I can interact with it in here but it also should be able to uh, insert the file I just created as well. So let's just find a 3D models from this device from the desktop. We should see the turbo and insert. Okay, just the. There we go. So I should be able to make that a bit bigger. And the same applies. I can spin this around in here as well. Probably better if I'd have removed this one. But you could see the uh, perhaps the how we quickly we could get that in here. If I right click, we get different views. So you can choose different views of this kind of preset or I could interact with it here so you could in actually put this alongside some text you know we've got the text here and you could create yourself kind of an interactive 3d manual perhaps so just some quick ideas okay so so the next um, format I just want to cover is x3d which I mentioned was the uh, XML format so it's an open format based on um, based on XML. It was really the follow-on to VRML. Um, so it has the ability to create. A, so you'd have the ability to create a profile for this, as we did with that Tech SVG. I don't know. I don't believe there is one. But again, if you're in a standards-based environment, you know that that would be kind of a more suitable open format, perhaps. Uh, if you wanted to validate them against something, a schema. 
Again, there's no plugin required um, as with GLTF. So how do you author? So the answer, uh, sorry, the question is how do we author those files? How do we add interactivity, connect those to parts lists and so forth? So the same questions apply. Uh, the good thing about um, X3D is it has what we call a DOM, document object model, which does allow us to add um, the 3D file into a HTML. So that's a good thing. The only downside we found is with the XML format is that it, the file sizes can be larger because of its text encoded. So that can be something to take note of. So not as light a format as GLTF. So I'm just going to go back to um, this Edit 3D and to this uh, exploded view here. And this time I'm going to export, uh, instead of a GLB, I'm going to export as a X3D. And then the DOM, X3D DOM. Um, so it, you can see here it creates, it's saying a HTML file. I'll put that on the desktop again and I'm going to save it. This time I will open the file. And um, okay, we should be, uh, I think we should be good with that. It should open directly into Chrome. So hey, here we go. So the model behaves well. I can, I can zoom in on it and, and so forth. But the thing is here, I've got the, the model tree, the parts list, and then I can click on this to highlight the different parts. So if I just move this around, so you can see it highlights it. So here we have that interactivity, that link between the 3D and the parts list or model tree. And we just, uh, we've just made the, uh, the ability to actually change the names on these as well, so they mean more. So we're, we're getting to a point, I think, where we've got something that our users can be really useful for them to use. But uh, but model still behaves uh, nicely. Uh, we don't have a bi directional on this at the moment. So another quick demo, as you can see, was quite a lot of demos involved in today's presentation. But thankfully, they've all gone quite smoothly. So uh, that's the end of the demonstration, and hopefully uh, you've got you've gained something. You've learned something about file formats, interactivity, and how that can be enabled. Um, certainly, I think it's really useful for the end user to be able to interact with the graphics, adds more value. Um, and I think if you're using the right software, it, it, it really does make it, your life easier creating these files. And there's a real opportunity to add interactivity to both 2D and 3D. But the, the big dependency, I feel, is really the file format. You've got to choose the right one, and it really needs to support metadata. and oh, and being open, using open formats, uh, which all the ones you've seen today are, like even GLTF is an open format, it's not proprietary to any particular company. For me, particularly in the 3D world, it is really important because the danger is that a lot of files could be actually, uh, with 3D especially, could go into proprietary viewers and so forth, which means the interoperability will definitely go down and, and make it difficult to, uh, put out to the audience, different audiences. I think we've come to the conclusion we're, we're really on board with GLTF and GLB, especially with that support within uh, Microsoft as well. Um, so it does show it has a broader appeal, has good support on metadata and uh, optimizes the file sizes. So I um, hope you've enjoyed today's presentation. Um, I'm just going to go now to q and I'll bring Don back online. Uh, Don's been monitoring the, the questions. So hopefully Don can put his microphone back on. Yes. So yes. If you want to add any questions now, please do. We'll be really pleased to answer them. Uh, if not, then just email us. Uh, yes, David, we, we do have one question here that uh, a good question about uh, one user says many of the engineering design packages already 
have call outs assigned to the parts internally. I assume he's talking about when they're exported uh, in CGM or SVG or something. Uh, can these be leveraged to do the hotspots almost automatically? And the answer to that is yes. Uh, if we're working, if you're working with our BizX Edit, you can import the drawing into uh, BizX Edit, and we have an auto hotspotting tool that will that will scan or call outs. So you can prim, it's parameterized, so you can set up, uh, configure it to scan for your call outs and turn them automatically into hotspots. And then when you export it as a CGM or SVG, those hotspots are are in there ready to go. So yes, we've got tools and then we've even got, uh, if the drawing was in a raster format like TIFF, we could even hotspot those too, as we have a built-in OCR engine in the VizX edit that will OCR, will scan a drawing and, and pick out the callouts in, in the raster drawing and OCR them and, and turn them into vector callouts. So uh, so yeah, so that, that was a very good question. Yeah. We definitely can do that. Yeah, on the on the three D side as well with the with the CAD model, uh, we also showed the X three D. So the the model tree that comes in is from the CAD file. Um, so and then the interactivity is linked between the model tree and the uh, the three D illustration, if we call it, or three D model. So, um, but. So in theory, it is, it's not quite the same as Hotspot in 2D. It's more of an interaction between the part, not as, it's not between the, that and an annotation. So, but um, it's something we'll probably look at in the future where you might have a, an annotated 3D file. So like a, a call out to the 3D part, perhaps. Um, so somebody had somebody did have some difficulty with uh, with the audio, uh, audio, but I think it was only one person done. So I'm assuming we've still got quite a big audience out there. So the audio was working. Yes, yeah, I think it was one person, and I can see from the Chrome Pro panel looks like their audio is working again now. So okay, that's good. Oh okay. yeah. Um, another question here: uh, Can you show interactivity of zooming in into a two D image as part of the hotspot? i.e. when you hover over the image rather than as part of the con uh, control panel. Um, I don't have an example of that, but I'm, I'm pretty sure that that is possible, Don, as you move over, that you could create a viewport that, that would then zoom into that area, or if you click on it, it would zoom into that area as well on the 2D. Yeah, I assume that you're talking about the ability to, to have a, a zoom uh, interactive zoom that's that's then zoomable in the browser or when you yeah. deploy it in the browser and and yes you could do that um, yeah you can set yeah. a viewport and then yeah you can set a viewport that goes into, for that particular for that hotspot uh, it's not yeah, like something so, yeah. to have an example for but we could we could create something to do that and that that's really part of the hotspot specification uh, certainly within CGM. I'm, I'm not too sure about SVG, Don. You, I'm not sure you, if you clicked on a hotspot in SVG, you can make it zoom into a particular area as well. Yeah, that would take a little JavaScript to go with that, but it, it's doable. It's not it's, it's not like the, um, the viewport functionality is something that's built into web CGM. It's kind of just, it's specified and, and, it, and it kind of points out a difference between CGM and SVG is some of this functionality that we're used to in WebCGM is part of the standard, whereas in SVG, it's a more generalized format. And some of that stuff we've had to extend SVG with our, like our tech SVG to kind of standardize those so that those kind of things can easily be performed. Um, Hi. So I think the short answer is yes, but we don't have an example that we could show you now. Yeah. So the, um, Next question, are there plans for S1000D support of GLTF and GLB? Um, not as far as we know. There, there are, if, you, if you go to the specification, obviously it's a big spec, um, there are actually no specified 3D formats. So it's pretty much open to what you want to use. And in some ways that kind of worries me that they, that they haven't standardized on anything. 
because then we're going to have the opportunity for multiple 3D viewers uh, within, uh, say, a, an ITM, from one ITM to another, Interactive Electronic Technical Manual, sorry. Um, so I'd, I'd, I don't know why they haven't done that, um, uh, perhaps because of the work that would be involved in doing, doing it. So what they've done at the moment is they've really specified that whatever you choose, you document it within the, the project's business rules. Um, our advice is uh, use an open format. Uh, say GLTF or X3D, do not use proprietary because that, I think, downstream will lead you into a difficulty uh, with interoperability and distributing that information. And then, you know, what if that vendor uh, unfortunately might go out of business, then you're left with something that you can't move somewhere else. So our advice, always use something open from file format point of view. That's always been our strategy of us being involved with CGM. Uh, uh, there's a question now which I don't um, quite understand. Don't uh, the illustration or oh, without should be defined from the contract each platform. Yeah, so it, I think just reiterating what I've just said is that that it should be um, with the absence of a standard, it should be defined within the contract for each platform, which is fine. But I, I would still say. If you have the option, choose if you as a as the vendor, or uh, you should choose something open, or encourage the uh, say the OEM to go an open format. Um, sorry, we have another question. Okay. Yeah. Um, Sorry, does a, does any of the mentioned three D formats offer an easy approach to build a graphical three D navigation from assembly to assembly by hotspotting? Um, I think I could say yes, <laughs> but I won't uh, because I think it's something that uh, we want to explore more ourselves, especially with GLTF. Is like what is the opportunity to I say like I can hear where you come. So say you have an overall assembly and you want to break that assembly down. So you want to go to another image or a, a breakdown of that, an exploded view of that particular assembly. So in other words, navigating through some three D file uh, graphically. Um, I've not seen a, a good example of that, but it's something we we want to explore. We we really think this is a a great format. To, for your 3D files, if that if I'm on the right track, Don, do you agree? Yeah, yeah. I, but I would just um, what I would say though is that uh, I think that um, with X3D or GLTF, I think there is a pathway to do that because those are both supported by the browsers. Um, you can enhance. You can add to. Uh, for instance, you can using JavaScript. You can get events from the um, from the hotspots in the uh, in the drawings and then do navigation with javascript so i would say i would qualify that i would say with x3d and um, gltf that's possible uh, i would say it would be harder to do if if we use something like 3d pdf or something like that i would say that certainly x3d was probably the most friendly format for doing what what the user has uh, suggested there yeah i agree I, again it's something that um, we are looking to kind of build a kind of uh, a scenario of where that's possible with with other scenarios as well which we've um you know we, we quite like i know that the audience here is probably don't use word and so forth, but we think that's got a, the scope for a kind of a more uh, mass way of getting this information out to end users. But certainly within our environment, our primary environment, where aerospace, defense, automotive, manufacturing, then the web is really the predominant way that people distribute their information. So we want to explore how we could have, like, say, a proof of concept where we can navigate and give something uh, more meaningful to the end user, navigating around a 3D graphic very easily 
linking. So it, it, it makes the whole experience, you know, more valuable to them. So just kind of watch this space as we go through the year. Um, we've got a lot of work to do, uh, but uh, we, I feel that we've got to run a good um, path to actually making 3D information easier to create for technical publications, but also easier to distribute as well, which is, you know, the other part of the jigsaw. So um, I think that's uh, the end of the questions. Yeah. Um, thank you for all of those. That's really good feedback. Uh, very valuable from our point of view. Uh, and thank you for the kind comments and the questions as well. You know, we really uh, want to give you the best information we can and make these uh, webinars as informative as possible. Um, as we encourage you to download the handouts. Uh, we'll also probably put those on the on LinkedIn and so forth. But certainly, we'll put those. Uh, we'll put the presentation on there. We'll give you a link to it. Uh, so all the slides you'll be able to get and use the links that we put in there. Um, so just like to thank everybody for attending today and all your feedback. Um, and thanks to Don for the uh, his input as well. So wish everybody to stay safe, and uh, we'll hopefully see you again at another webinar in the future. Thank you again.